ustedes creen en este, esta meta. Uh, y muchas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. My name is Carlos Menchaca, and I want to say good morning to all of you. I am the chair of the Committee on Immigration here at the New York City Council. Uh, I, when they come, I will recognize all the members of the committee who are joining us today. I'm happy to be holding this hearing in conjunction with my brother, uh, Councilmember Jumani Williams, and chair of the Housing and Buildings Committee. I look forward to learning about immigrant tenant harassment from this administration, our community-based organizations, and impacted New Yorkers. Every New Yorker has the right to live free from harassment and threats by their landlords. This is why this session the Council has passed multiple bills addressing tenant harassment and intended to send a clear message to unscrupulous landlords. We will not tolerate discrimination or harassment of any New Yorker. These bills enhance the protections available to New Yorkers and raise the penalties for landlords who violate the law. While anyone can be subject to landlord harassment, some communities experience it at higher rates than others. Immigrant communities are among the most impacted and affected by these unscrupulous landlords. And intro 1678A, which expands the definition of harassment to include behavior that targets tenants because of their immigration status perceived or, to, or perceived to be immigrants. While there exists a strong framework of anti-discrimination laws at the federal, the state, and the city at our local level, including the New York City Human Rights Law, immigrants currently do not have recourse under the tenant harassment statute. Intro 1678A will change that. New York is a proud sanctuary city, but I want to be clear, these bills are not about sanctuary. They are about basic rights to freedom and to live without fear or harassment or discrimination. These are bills that protect New Yorkers and their families. They are bills that exemplify our city's values and strengthen our city's commitment and our council's commitment to equal protection and treatment. And with that, I want to also read Councilmember Ku's statement. Thank you to the Housing Chair Jamani Williams and Immigration Chair Carlos Menchaca. Today we will be hearing a bill I introduced that looks to crack down on immigrant tenant harassment. This bill looks to expand the definition of harassment under the Housing Maintenance Code to include discriminatory threats and requests for proof of citizenship. This would allow tenants to bring harassment claims directly against landlords through housing court. Intro 1678, the term harassment, would include any threats based on age, rage, uh, sorry, age, race, creed, color, national origin, gender, disability, marital status, partnership status, caregiver status, sexual orientation, or alienage or citizenship status. It would also include those who refuse to accept a government-issued ID and those who request citizenship documents after a valid ID has already been provided. We've heard reports from around the city of landlords who would demand citizenship, citizenship documents from their tenants, leaving many to fear repercussions if they do not provide what's being asked of them. This bill looks to protect tenants and strengthen their rights by giving them an additional recourse through housing court where they can file harassment claims against those who use these threatening tactics. My office has had immigrant tenant services for the last two years where we have heard several of these stories. Intro 1678 looks to address these violations. Thank you, Councilmember Peter Ku. I also want to thank my staff, uh, Veronica Piedra Leon, my Chief of Staff, uh, Adriana Garcia, my Deputy Chief of Staff, and our committee council who works tirelessly every single time we bring a committee to all of you on these important issues. Uh, Indiana Porta, thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill out a card with the Sergeant of Arms. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Matthew Eugene. I do want to recognize in the audience uh, former Assemblymember Keith Wright, who's with us as well. And we have well, the first, uh, first panel, uh, Jordan Press, Executive Director of Development and Planning in the Division of Government Affairs, HPD, Bida Mostafi, Acting Commissioner, New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner, 
of the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Can you all please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you very much and you can begin in the order of your preference. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you to Chairman Chaka, Chair Williams, and members of the Committees of Immigration and the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Acting Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. My testimony today will focus on Introduction 1678 and Moya's efforts to ensure the well-being of immigrant New Yorkers. I will highlight the steps Moya and its sister agencies have taken to protect immigrants against housing discrimination in New York City and express our support for the City Council's efforts to provide additional protections for tenants who are harassed by their landlords. I want to thank the chairs and the committee members for continuing to fight to protect immigrant New Yorkers. As Acting Commissioner of Moya, I have seen how xenophobic rhetoric, aggressive calls for immigration enforcement, and instances of discrimination have created fear in immigrant communities across our city. Introduction 1678 sends the message that the city is committed to fighting against discrimination that has no place here in New York City. As the City Commission on Human Rights will testify, my colleague Dana sitting next to me, the city human rights law already prohibits discrimination by housing providers, landlords, or their employees on the basis of immigration status. However, the xenophobic rhetoric and aggressive immigration enforcement policies at the federal level have emboldened some owners and landlords to discriminate against tenants on the basis of their actual or perceived immigration status. Some of these discriminatory actions have been publicly reported, or reported to CCHR and, and other investigative bodies. We suspect that some of these acts have not been reported at all. Recognizing the increased need for information in the current political climate, Moya has built on its previous work with its partners across the city and stakeholders and communities, including CCHR, to hold days of action and perform outreach to immigrant New Yorkers about their rights. Moya and its sister agencies along with elected officials, have held two days of action on housing discrimination, including one in June, when several city agencies, including Moya, CCHR, the Department of Housing and Preservation Development, the Human Resources Administration, the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs Unit, and the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit, distributed flyers on housing rights and answered questions on tenant harassment in Jackson Heights and Corona, and one at the end of August in Sunnyside, following public reports of displays of Nazi and Confederate uh, imagery, swastikas and other hate symbols in a building in Sunnyside. Moya also continues to conduct outreach and Know Your Rights events where we highlight the protections against discrimination in housing contexts provided by the city's human rights law. We also have provided literature and trained community-based organizations to provide this information around discrimination protections to their communities. Our Public Engagement Unit Tenant Support Unit also conducts proactive outreach throughout the city to speak with tenants about their rights and identify tenants being harassed by their landlords. Since January, Moya has participated in over 400 events where we've shared information about the right to be free of discrimination and directed residents to call CCHR if they have a complaint or want to learn more. These events have included tabling at CCHR's annual fair housing symposium in the Bronx and at a senior center housing fair in Brooklyn, as well as multiple Know Your Rights forums across the five boroughs. The city also actively investigates reports of discrimination. As CCHR will testify, the administration has significantly increased its enforcement efforts in the area of housing discrimination. For example, CCHR doubled its number of investigations of housing discrimination based on immigration status or national origin in 2016 compared to 2015. Introduction 1678 would amend the definition of tenant harassment to include threatening any person lawfully entitled to occupancy based on their citizenship status or alienage or several other characteristics refusing to accept any valid government-issued ID presented by anyone lawfully entitled to occupancy, and requesting documentation from anyone lawfully entitled to occupancy that would disclose citizenship status 
or alienage if the person has already provided a valid government-issued personal ID. These actions would give rise to rebuttable presumptions of tenant harassment. Access to housing is an issue that affects all New Yorkers, including immigrant New Yorkers, and it is crucial that the city does all that it can to prevent exploitation and discrimination in the housing context. Undocumented immigrants in particular are vulnerable to harassment because of the extremely negative effects of deportation. An immigrant who faces these kinds of threats may simply choose to move instead of risking the possibility of deportation. For this reason, Moya supports the intent of Introduction 1678. While the city human rights law already provides protection for New Yorkers who face discrimination in housing, this bill, in conjunction with the tenant harassment reforms recently passed by the council, would provide an additional avenue for tenants seeking relief. We know that because the human rights law already covers discrimination in housing, there may be situations where a tenant is unable to bring both a tenant harassment claim and a human rights law claim. But we look forward to working to discuss ways to address this issue with the council. The bill would also allow tenants to bring harassment claims if their landlord requests a form of identification and refuses to accept a valid government-issued ID like IDNYC, the city's municipal ID card, which is a secure form of government-issued identification and which we are happy to say over one million New Yorkers have. In addition, this bill dovetails with the administration's historic investment in legal representation for tenants in housing court. HRA's Office of Civil Justice funds legal services for low-income tenants facing harassment from unscrupulous landlords, and this bill would expand the grounds for low-income immigrant tenants to bring harassment claims in the housing court. In conclusion, the, the administration is committed to protecting the rights of all New Yorkers, including our immigrant New Yorkers. Thank you again for allowing us to provide testimony on this important bill that protects immigrant New Yorkers from exploitation and discrimination in housing. We look forward to continuing to work with the council on this bill. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague at the Commission on Human Rights. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Williams, Chairman Chaka, and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings and the Committee on Immigration. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. The Commission does not regularly appear before these committees, but we are very happy to be here to testify today with our partners at Moya and HPD to discuss the work the Commission is doing to address discrimination in housing, and specifically with respect to housing discrimination on the basis of immigration status and national origin. Our work enforcing the city human rights law and combating discrimination is particularly relevant to Introduction 1678, which would expand the definition of tenant harassment to include threats based on discrimination on the basis of alienage and citizenship status, gender, disability, and many other protected categories, similar to the protections that exist in the city human rights law. With the, commission, with the councils and the administration's support, and under Commissioner and Chair Carmel and Malalas, the Commission has grown in both size and in scope as we work to strategically enforce the city human rights law, one of the broadest and most protective anti-discrimination laws in the country. Inquiries into the Commission have increased by 60% from 2015 to 2016, and we are on pace to exceed our 2016 numbers. As I will describe below, we have significantly increased our enforcement efforts to protect tenants who are being harassed based on immigration status and or national origin, and those who are being retaliated against for asserting their rights under the city human rights law. In New York City, it is illegal under the city human rights law for housing providers, landlords, or their employees or agents to discriminate against tenants by creating a hostile environment of harassment based on their race, religion, immigration status, sexual orientation, or any other protected class under the human rights law. Harass or threaten tenants because of their race, religion, immigration status, sexual orientation, or any other protected class. Refuse to make repairs or provide equal services to tenants because of their protected class, or retaliate against tenants who report discriminatory behavior, or neglect to ensure that their employees and agents are trained on their responsibilities under the city human rights law, including supers, maintenance workers, brokers, and salespeople. Over the past two years, the Commission has significantly increased enforcement efforts to address housing discrimination and tenant harassment, tripling the number of investigations in this area. The Commission is currently investigating over 570 claims of housing discrimination. 
over 75 of which directly involve tenant harassment. One example of, the of this work is reflected in the investigation the Commission launched, launched in August on behalf of the city following reports from Majority Leader Jimmy Van Bremer of a hostile environment due to alleged tenant harassment by a property manager at a condo building in Sunnyside, connected to Nazi and Confederate imagery, swastikas, and other hate symbols in the lobby, and other harassing and discriminatory behavior. As my colleague, Acting Commissioner Mustofi, discussed in conjunction with the launch of the investigation, the Commission, Moya, CAU, PEU, HRA, and others held a day of action in Sunnyside, Queens, where we distributed flyers on tenants' rights and discriminatory harassment and answered questions on legal protections and services against, um, that we provide to fight discrimination and harassment. As a direct result of the press conference, announcement of the investigation and outreach, the Commission has seen a tangible increase in reports of tenant harassment in recent months and increased awareness among advocates and organizers of tenants' rights under the city human rights law. It is also illegal under the city human rights law to retaliate against anyone for reporting discrimination, regardless of their immigration status. No one should fear for their safety or their security when reporting violations of the law, and the Commission will not hesitate to take action against bad actors when they retaliate against New Yorkers who have reported discrimination. The Commission is cracking down against these bad acting landlords filing retaliation charges and sending cease and desist letters um, when we have reason to believe that they are acting in a retaliatory manner in violation of the city human rights law. As reports of discrimination have increased across the city, so too have retaliation charges. The Commission has increased investigations into retaliation by nearly 60% over the last two years, filing 260 claims of retaliation in over 2015 and 2016, as compared to 165 in 2013 and 2014. The most typical forms of retaliation include trying to evict tenants from the building, refusing to renew a lease, refusing to fix issues in tenants' apartments, cutting off utilities and other services, or harassing tenants and or encouraging others to do so. For example, earlier this year, the Commission served a landlord a notice of a complaint alleging discrimination after Make the Road brought a case to the Commission. In his response letter to the Commission, the landlord denied the allegations and indicated that he had sent a copy of that letter to ICE, which included the tenant's personal information in violation of the city human rights law's anti-retaliation protections. The Commission is now charging that landlord with retaliation against his tenants and has filed an additional complaint against him on behalf of the city. Similarly, in June, the Commission sent a cease and desist letter to landlord Czar Realty for discriminating against its immigrant tenants. Also in June, the Commission sent a cease and desist letter to landlord J. Deep Reddy after it learned that he was discriminating against tenants based on their immigration status and retaliating against them for asserting their rights. Over the past two years, the Commission has increased enforcement focusing on immigration status and national origin. We have doubled the number of investigations into discrimination in these areas, filing 376 claims over the past two years compared to 155 in the two years prior. In 2016 alone, we more than doubled the number of new investigations into discrimination based on immigration status and or national origin and housing, filing 60 claims in 2016 compared to 22 in 2015. The Commission is currently investigating over 300 claims of discrimination based on immigration status and or national origin over all protected um, classifications, 100 of which specifically in housing. We also train housing providers on their responsibilities under the law with the goal of preventing future acts of discrimination. And we regularly engage housing advocates and vulnerable communities to address concerns around housing discrimination and inform communities of their rights. The Commission has the authority to, vi to find violators with civil penalties of up to $250,000 for willful and ma malicious violations of the law and can award compensatory damages to victims, including emotional distress damages and other benefits. The Commission can also order affirmative relief, including trainings, changes to policies, and restorative justice, such as com community service. The Commission works closely with our agency partners, including many of the agencies here today, to educate and inform the public on their rights under the city human rights law and how to avail themselves of city resources, including how to file a complaint or report discrimination to the Commission. I've highlighted some of those recent outreach efforts in our testimony, including um, an, a citywide campaign, You Have Rights NYC, to inform New Yorkers of their rights against discrimination and harassment, holding several days of action, as we've already discussed, holding press conference and, and pitching news stories around enforcement actions um, against landlords and brokers, partnering with community-based organizations, legal service providers, schools, houses of worship, 
um, council members, community boards, and many others to provide Know Your Rights information and to empower communities to identify discrimination and harassment and holding nearly 400 workshops and outreach events on housing discrimination this year, including our annual Fair Housing Symposium. We encourage victims and witnesses of discrimination or harassment to call the Commission's info line, which is 718-722-3131, or call 311. Reports can be filed anonymously, which is very important for folks to know. People may also report discrimination through a form on our website. Now turning to intro 1678. Intro 1678 would provide tenants with an additional venue to assert claims of discriminatory tenant harassment in addition to filing those claims at the Commission. The Commission strongly encourages the Council to consider aligning all areas of protection against discrimination in housing under the City Human Rights Law with the list of protections in Intro 1678. Protections against discrimination for victims of domestic violence, sexual offenses, and stalking. Protections against discrimination based on one's source of income, which is the use of housing vouchers or other uh, rental subsidies. And protections based on the presence of children in the home should all be added to the bill, as that would align it with the protections under the City Human Rights Law. In addition, the City Human Rights Law definition of alienage and citizenship status is incorporated by reference in this bill, but no other City Human Rights Law definition is cited. Importantly, the, addition of, the definition of gender under the City Human Rights Law as amended in 2002 to include actual or perceived sex and gender identity, self-image, appearance, behavior, or expression, whether or not that gender identity, self-image, appearance, behavior, or expression is different from that traditionally associated with the legal sex assigned to that person at birth is defined in the City Human Rights Law, and we strongly encourage that this term also be incorporated by reference and any other terms defined in the City Human Rights Law. Finally, it is important to note that if a tenant chooses to bring a claim under this provision in housing court, it is possible that they may be precluded from bringing the same claim at the commission. Because the remedies in housing court are more limited, currently only civil penalties ranging from $1,000 to $10,000, compared to compensatory damages to the victim, civil penalties in the most egregious cases up to $250,000, and other affirmative relief, it is vital that tenants understand the options available to them and are able to make an informed decision regarding which venue they choose. However, we do support expanding venues for people to seek justice, whether it is in housing court or at the City Commission on Human Rights. We look forward to working with our partners at the City Council and partner agencies on this bill and other initiatives to ensure that tenants are protected from discrimination and, har and harassment in housing. Thank you so much for convening this important hearing and we look forward to your questions. Good morning, Chairman Williams, Chairman Menchaca, and members of the Committee of Housing and Buildings. My name is Jordan Press, and I'm Executive Director of Development and Planning in the Division of Government Affairs at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Intro 1269 regarding community land trusts and Intro 1721, which expands the definition of harassment in the Housing Maintenance Code. I'd like to start by explaining community land trusts, or CLTs as we call them. The Council has been an important partner to the Department as we look at CLTs as a model for affordable housing and ensuring long-term affordability. A CLT is a nonprofit organization formed to own land and maintain control and oversight of the houses or rental buildings that are located on the land. The CLT's land ownership paired with a governance structure that reflects the interests of CLT housing residents can offer a unique housing model that empowers residents and neighborhoods. CLTs are a new model for HPD and are relatively untested in the city. There's only one example in operation to date, which is at Cooper Square. HPD, with the strong support of advocacy groups and the city council, began looking into CLTs further in 2016. We researched examples around the country, such as in Burlington, Vermont, to better understand how CLTs can help achieve affordable housing goals. To further our work, HPD released a Request for Expressions of Interest, or RFEI, in January 2017 to learn what ideas local organizations had about how CLTs could be effective in New York City. HPD also released the RFE RFEI to identify qualified groups to form a CLT. All responses to the RFEI were required to describe the existing or proposed CLT's target geography and constituency, plan for the creation and maintenance of rental or home ownership housing, the organization's governance structure and operations plans, um, the, their affordable housing experience, and any projected future requests for support from the city. 
While the RFEI was pending, the city applied to and won a grant from Enterprise Community Partners, a national nonprofit with strong roots in New York City, to fund the growth of three CLTs and to create a learning exchange. The learning exchange will support nine additional community-based organizations interested in forming CLTs through the organization's new Community Land Trust Capacity Building Initiative. All of the beneficiaries of the grants were respondents to the RFE, RFEI, and over the next two years, the grant will fund operations and startup support while the CLTs work to identify sites for acquisition. As we continue to look at this model of affordable housing, it's important to highlight that CLTs are just one tool in our toolkit for ensuring long-term affordability. The city also has many regulatory and financing mechanisms to accomplish the same long-term affordability goals, and CLTs would rely on the same public subsidies as other forms of housing to serve New Yorkers in need of affordable housing. Before turning to the specifics of the bill, I want to thank the primary sponsor of the legislation. Councilmember Richards has tirelessly advocated for the formation of CLTs in his, in his district, and in July we were excited to, to jointly announce that $500,000 would be used to create the Interborough CLT, a coalition of groups who plan to bring affordable housing options to Edgemere and other neighborhoods around the city. This will help advance one of the goals of the resilient Edgemere community plan, which was to identify city-owned sites in the neighborhood that could be developed by a CLT. Many other council members, including the speaker, has, have pushed the department to build on our CLT work, and we appreciate this interest and support. Intro 1269 would require HPD to enter into regulatory agreements with CLTs. While we look forward to future discussions, Intro 1269, as drafted, would not further the intended goals of creating a more robust number of CLTs in New York City. Since HPD enters into regulatory agreements in most of its projects, we do not consider it necessary to legislate a requirement to enter into these agreements with CLTs at the time of application. At this time, we're most interested in seeing the three CLTs that received grant funding get off the ground by identifying properties to acquire, putting together their budgets, and ultimately working with us on financing and getting those regulatory agreements signed. Moving forward, we plan to continue conversations with the Council and thought-leading nonprofits in the community to discuss the best path forward if we want to expand the presence of CLTs further. I'd now like to speak on Intro 1721, sponsored by Chairman Williams, which amends the definition of harassment to include acts or omissions related to the violation of the Housing Maintenance Code and Construction Code, including information related to occupancy, information in construction documents, repeated failures to correct construction code violations, false certification of construction code corrections, and violating the permit section of the construction code in a way that negatively impacts the tenants. We thank Chairman Williams and the committee for your partnership and leadership to prevent tenant harassment. This not only puts the safety of tenants at risk, but threatens to destabilize families and even communities while the city loses affordable housing. HPD works diligently with a number of agencies to address this scourge and is committed to doing all that we can to root out illegal activity. We consistently work with the council to address tenant harassment and are proud of the steps we've taken together. This includes the formation of the Tenant Harassment Prevention Task Force, our work to deter harassment before it starts, penalizing bad landlords, and supporting victims of such harassment. HPD supports the intent of Intro 1721. We want to ensure that tenants have all the tools they need to address the many forms that harassment may take, including an owner using poor maintenance as a means of harassment. For example, falsifying occupancy status and falsely certifying corrections of a violation have serious implications for a tenant's quality of life, and we believe that this should be added to the definition of, hara of harassment. We do want to express concern that some provisions in the bill are broad. Failure to correct violations as a standalone issue may be a signal of a struggling owner or an owner unfamiliar with HBD or DOB rules and regulations, and not the sign of an owner who is intent on harassing. The Council has acknowledged that small owners can especially struggle financially with repairs. For example, many of the buildings in our alternative enforcement program are small properties with significant violations because of the difficulty to maintain the property and not necessarily because of an intent to harass tenants. Broad language regarding violations would result in these types of struggling property owners being found guilty of tenant harassment for having just two violations for the same non-emergency condition. We have developed multiple programs, including the Landlord Ambassadors Program and various preservation tools 
to assist these small property owners and continue to provide them with support whenever possible. We look forward to reviewing the specific language of the bill with the council to ensure that it appropriately captures instances of harassment um, and working together to, uh, to ensure we have no unintended consequences. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and have a public discussion on these bills. We look forward to answering any questions that you have. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. We have been also been joined by Council Members Rosenthal, Espinal, and Salamanca. Uh, Council Member and Chairman Chaka will be asking questions first. I did just want to flesh out one sentence beforehand that was from Moya. Uh, however, the xenophobic rhetoric and aggressive immigration enforcement policies at the federal level have emboldened some owners and landlords to discriminate against tenants on the basis of their actual or perceived immigration status. Since you cannot uh, maybe be as blunt, I want to make sure I was for the record. Uh, I believe uh, Donald J. Trump, who I unaffectionately call the orange man, uh, the Republicans and the conservatives that not only support his xenophobic, misogynist, uh, uh, anti-LGBTQA, uh, bigoted, uh, anti-Islamic, uh, Islamophobic, I should say, anti-Semitic, uh, not only continue to support him now, laid the pathway before and the atmosphere for him to rise. All of those people and him are the reason that people feel emboldened now. Uh, I wanted to make sure I made that clear and had that on the record. And with that, I'd like to uh, ask my colleague to ask the first set of questions. Thank you, Chair Williams. And uh, not just for that, for that uh, statement, but for that continued work that we're doing to fight that here in this city. And, and I think the conversation is, is, is geared around, around how we do that. And so thank you so much for testifying in support of, of the bill. Um, I think that 17, um, well, specifically with the bill on immigration, I want to talk a little bit about the work that immigrant communities are facing already in our communities. Do you know if there are certain immigrant organizations or uh, providers in our neighborhoods um, that are giving us information on both aid from, for both agencies that we can kind of point to that are disproportionately impacted by by this kind of harassment, how 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 are we measuring that citywide? Um, just to be clear, I understand the question. You mean sort of, are we working directly with particular organizations who are able to sort of educate communities and direct them on these issues? Is that the? Yeah, and specifically with complaints. So, uh, yeah. work in working with. Our organizations and and Moya and I think also CCHR also is working with organizations. Where have we seen the most complaints on immigrant immigrant related uh, or perceived immigrant related cases? Do you want to take? Um, unfortunately, I don't have sort of a breakdown by zip code or by um, national origin, perceived or or actual, with me today. But we can certainly get that data to you. And we are now kind of working through analyzing our 2017 numbers um, in advance of our, the publication of our annual report. So we should be able to get that to you. I can say anecdotally that we've partnered with organizations like Make the Road and local community-based organizations um, in, in different places. I mentioned a couple cases out of Queens. I think that that's been an area that's been um, you know, particularly highlighted by some of the work that we've been doing um, and the reports that we've been hearing. But beyond sort of the anecdotes, I won't be able to get into too many specifics, but we can certainly um, look at those numbers and get back to you on it. And I'll just add to that in terms of kind of what our um, kind of strategy has been in ensuring that uh, all immigrant New Yorkers have access to this information, particularly the most vulnerable. It has been um, to sort of ensure that from partners that we're funding, like through Action NYC and others, that they get a training on uh, the, the um, anti-discrimination protections 
uh, with, with the commission and how to refer individuals and identify those issues. Um, similarly, we uh, work with a myriad of providers uh, that serve harder to reach populations uh, throughout the city. Um, and that is intentional, of course, in ensuring that some of the more vulnerable populations that might not readily have access to education and, and information on city resources or contact are getting that firsthand through uh, their, their trusted leadership in communities. Um, and we've increased the engagement that we have had with faith leadership um, and have kind of continuously over the course of the last several months um, done readily uh, consistent engagement with thousands of faith leaders across the cities in partnership with the Center for um, Faith and Community Partnership at the mayor's office, um, where we've distributed uh, sort of toolkits on access to justice for immigrants that includes uh, information on the commission and how to make referrals. So there are sort of multi-tiered um, efforts and initiatives to make sure that we're effectively reaching leadership and trusted communities and with a focus on harder to reach populations. And again, I want to thank Moya for that, for that work. We've seen that uh, grow and expand into different neighborhoods. And, and really, that, that question was about trying to figure out what, what is happening, allow you to, to kind of celebrate that work of expansion and looking with faith, looking through organizations like faith-based organizations that really have a, not only a pulse, but a relationship and trust, uh, especially in the time that we're in right now. Um, but advocates still come back and say, we, we, need, we need more. Uh, or that there are still issues. And so uh, specifically with immigrant clients that want to access these, uh, these services. And so how is there a way that you can kind of speak to in, in, that, in that perspective? Not just that we're working to expand, but we are also issues, uh, understanding the issues and complaints and how, how we're going to post, post passing 1678 think about how we make sure that we, we solve those issues with access. Um, sure, I, I think specifically, um, you know, if 1678 is passed, what we would, what the commission would love to do in conjunction with Moy and HPD is ensure that housing advocates who are in the courts and also the housing court judges themselves understand these new provisions and understand the different options of venue for bringing these claims. I think that's really critical and we're, you know, more than happy to work with all the partners in the room to create materials and educational opportunities. As um, Acting Commissioner Mustafi mentioned, we cross-train our staff, so we have a hotline um, with, uh, uh, you know, live intake um, during business hours. That team is also trained on Action NYC. Action NYC folks are trained on the commission and our resources. 311. We've worked extensively with 311 to sort of figure out where cases will go. And and again, if it goes to sort of the wrong or not the best fit agency, we cross refer all the time. Um, so I think working in partnership with all of the different city resources that are available, you know, an individual shouldn't have to know exactly where they need to go. We can figure that out for them. Um, in addition, um, you know, we launched, the commission launched um, in May a broad citywide campaign that highlighted the different forms of discrimination that particular vulnerable, particularly vulnerable communities are facing in New York City, whether it be harassment on the street because a woman is wearing a hijab or someone being told to speak Spanish to their, or speak English to their kids when they're speaking Spanish or being discriminated against and turning, turned away for housing. And we've, we, you know, the response from that, um, that campaign was an outgrowth of focus groups and, and community roundtables that the commission hosted, um, some in partnership with Moya as well, um, where communities came to us and said, we need more visibility, we need to see this information. And so that was a direct response. Um, that was, you know, subways and buses and on social media and, and in different languages. So um, we, we let, you know, that, that was sort of, what we heard from the community and, and we used what resources we had to try and get the message out as best as we could in, those pub in a very public way. I'll just add one additional item, which is that um, the creation of the tenant support unit um, is extremely important in this, uh, in the, on this topic. Um, and we additionally cross-train and support each other in this work. So they have been fully trained on identifying harassment 
their team is multilingual um, as well and, and so has the ability to engage directly with tenants um, and again help sort of identify issues but in a sort of on boots on the ground kind of door, door knocking kind of systematic way that um, is extremely important at a time certainly when some people might have uh, reasonable uh, fears or hesitation in coming forward. So their job is to sort of have that individualized contact with a um, kind of menu of issues that they understand and know how to report and identify. Thank you for that. And again, it's just really great to put on the record that this stuff is happening and for our advocates to kind of hear that uh, that work uh, and that thought process as we go through the legislative process. And my kind of final question really comes out of out of that uh, kind of post passing of the bill and when it, and when we can start implementation and the work seems pretty productive already and I feel I feel positive and and, and good about that. Uh, but there does seem to be that problem both of you spoke to in your testimony about that referral moment where do we bring it to the housing court or or a human rights commission. Uh, and so, how, how do we how do we solve that? Um, that there could be a possible legislative uh, fix, and can we start talking about that now? And do you have any proposals that you want to speak to us about now that we can start working on it? I think we're going to have to kind of solve that uh, in kind of parallel in some ways, and so uh, we don't want to wait too long. Do you have any proposals for us? I. I'm not sure I have a specific proposal today, but I know that we are very interested in working to figure out um, whether there is a conflict and then how to resolve a con the conflict. Um, what I will say is, is from our, our civil law enforcement team that bring that investigates and prosecutes um, discrimination claims, we often do have people with housing court claims that are related to the discrimination claim, and they've. In, shared with me that it is very challenging for an individual, as you can imagine, to navigate a housing court case and a discrimination case in two different places with two different entities, and also for sort of housing court to recognize the discrimination claim in the context of their housing court case. So I think having a central location where people can also raise these discrimination claims is important. Um, what I what we're, what is still sort of an open question for us is um, ensuring that people sort of under if they are bringing an affirmative case, for example, and it's not sort of an eviction defense, um, that people understand the pros and cons of where to go. Um, we are an agency that is sort of a public-facing entity meant for people with or without representation, and most of our folks are without representation, and that our system is built to serve folks without representation. Um, so we. We are set up in a different way than housing court, obviously. We are not a court. We are an agency. Um, we do litigate claims at oath, um, and our remedies look different as well. So um, I think it's, it's just a, a continued conversation as to how to ensure that people are informed of their rights and that they know it's, it's possible, and again, we still have to explore this further, that bringing a claim in one venue might preclude you from bringing the same claim in the other. So tell me about that. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is the, what does a might mean? Um, so I think we have to sort of consult with the law department and, and, and folks in our agencies to understand the exact contours, but out the provision, there are provisions of the human rights law that essentially say if you bring a claim, an identical claim in another court of competent jurisdiction, that you, again, I'm going to say may because I don't want to place definitives here, you may not be able to bring that identical claim in another court because you've essentially chosen your venue. And you can understand why a defendant might you know, that this is, in a sense, a due process issue. A defendant may be facing claims, identical claims in multiple venues based on this identical facts. And so the, the law basically says you choose your court, and then once you've passed a certain threshold in the process, you really can't start filing the same claim in another venue. Um, but again, I, I don't, I want to sort of further explore the details of how that might work. Um, well, we're eager to figure that out yeah. together. Uh, and. Uh, and last question on the CLTs, the, the announcement of the July funding was a great, great announcement for CLT work. I, I'm kind of curious about how that kind of came together, uh, how, how that mechanism works, and is this a, is this, this kind of pilot project that can be brought into multiple communities, and, and where, 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 what are the, the kind of fertile ground for, for growing that yep. in other parts of the city? Right. 
So a little bit more history on, um, on the RFEI and, and what occurred. We had a number of organizations coming to us interested in CLTs broadly and actually some who had some very specific ideas about what they wanted to do. If it was going to involve the disposition of city-owned land, we have sole sourcing rules where we don't just, you know, turn over city-owned property to uh, the first group that comes to us with a great idea about a CLT. And so we wanted to um, justify who the organizations were that we might potentially dispose of city-owned land to um, and, and came up with the idea of this uh, request for expressions of interest so that we could find qualified respondents so that if we got to that point, we would be able to justify the, um, the disposition to them. The second thing that we wanted to do with the RFEI was we knew there were a wide range of different ideas about how CLTs might work and, and the goals they wanted to accomplish, and we wanted to put it into one place where we could hear all of those ideas. Um, and so that, that was the genesis of that RFEI. And then the funding stream. So, yeah, so that was a um, great, somewhat serendipitous um, uh, confluence of, of events that while this RFEI was out there that Enterprise Community Partners, I believe with um, uh, funding from settlement cases uh, related to the, to the oh. mortgage crisis, had, um, had this funding available. They conducted a, a competition. New York City applied. Um, and won $1.65 million, and the application was to um, further the growth of some specific CLTs, so the, there were cash awards to three different entities, and then we used a, a fourth pot of money to create this learning collaborative so that a number of the applicants who had good ideas, but mm -hmm. they weren't, and they were, you know, well, good ideas, but they weren't, um, quite as far along in their, the maturation of, of what they wanted to do um, could, could work as part of a learning collaborative and, and develop that and get to the same place that the other three were in. Very cool, very cool, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before I go to my question, we only have one, we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. There's only one Council Member signed up, so I'm gonna allow her five minutes to ask her questions and then we'll come back to mine. Thank you so much, Chair Williams and Chairman Chaka, for holding this hearing on these three really important bills. And I appreciate the comments from um, the administration on them. I, I really would like to focus on intro 1721. Um, you know, so often in my district, we have situations where the landlords falsely claim on the DOB permit that a building is unoccupied, which allows them, of course, to skirt the tenant protections um, until they're found out, at which point, you know, they just have to file some paperwork and a lot of the work, a lot of the damage is already done. We passed intro 944 earlier this year to require that the occupancy status be listed right on the work permit. Um, so tenants who live there could uh, quickly identify that uh, occupancy, that the owner had, had not been straight about uh, occupancy. So I'm thrilled that intro 1721 would make false claims on these permits evidence of harassment. I just want to clarify that lying about occupancy status on a PW1 would um, be the type of act included in this expanded definition. Yes, I believe that's correct. That's a confident yes. <laughs> I believe that's correct. Do you want to get back to me on that? Because it's pretty important. Yeah, so I do believe it's correct. If I'm incorrect, I will get back to you. Um, if it's not explicit, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, let's talk about making explicit. Sure. 
Um, and, and just from your understanding, what are the existing consequences for falsely claiming a building is unoccupied on a PW1 application? Um, the penalties vary depending on the type of work that is being done without permit. Um, the current minimum for violations of uh, Section 28.105.1 range from $500 to $10,000, and the maximums go as high as $25,000. So in the cases we've seen in our district, no one ever gets fined. They just file new paperwork. Mm -hmm. So that that I, I raise that point to remind us why um, the having now, uh, which the, you know, uh, the mayor, Mayor de Blasio signed into law, the notion of an office of the tenant advocate inside the Department of Buildings, you know, the, the idea is that if you had someone in buildings who was thinking about the tenants, in the same way that your department thinks so hard about tenant harassment, we might be able to get some of the consequences to stick. Um, and I hope you'll join me in working to make sure that the Office of the Tenant Advocate has its own uh, direct line to the commissioner that is a deputy commissioner position um, and that they would be responsible for the enforcement of the laws that the mayor just passed, which, uh, you know, the advocacy groups, uh, Stand for Tenant Safety, advocated for, and some of the other tenant harassment bills that we have. It is the missing piece in the puzzle because the harassment, for the most part, Tenants are dependent on the Department of Buildings to issue a violation, yet the Department of Buildings does not have as part of its mission to address tenant harassment. And so I really hope uh, HPD will join us in making sure that DOB joins us in a very meaningful way at the table to address tenant harassment issues. We look forward to having those conversations with both you and DOB. Thank you so much, and again, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. We're also joined by uh, Council Member Mendez. Uh, I'm going to, oh, and uh, Council Member Levine. I'm going to ask a few questions and then go back to questions from my colleagues. First, uh, on 1721, you, you brought up some items. Uh, so one, I'm just glad that all the agencies seem to be uh, agreeing with the bills, at least in intent, um, which makes this actually pretty, uh, pretty kumbaya hearing, so that's good. Um, but there are some uh, tweaks, I, I guess, that are going to be suggested, which I'm happy to discuss. But with 1721, um, it looked like you wanted to add some additional language, and also you want to make sure language wasn't too broad. And can you just talk about a little bit, expand that a little bit, and do you have any particular language that you think might be helpful to fine tune that so we're not grabbing people that aren't intending to harass, uh, but just need some additional assistance? Yes. So um, again, as I stated in my, uh, in my testimony, the question of, um, repeated failures to correct the violations, uh, no doubt that that is a problem and, and that it needs to be addressed. And we have um, both the tenant and HPD have remedies to try to compel those uh, violations to be required in the court. I think the question is uh, whether that necessarily constitutes harassment. And I think um, it, it's a court that determines what is harassment. It's, it's not HPD. We don't bring harassment cases. Um, and so our intent here with this legislation, I think, should be to assist the court um, in, in having clarity in the law, and we certainly don't want to muddy any waters. You, you specifically asked 
that we review specific language of the bill. So do you have specific language to submit for us to review? Um, we, I, th I think we would be happy to sit down and, and go over those specific provisions, and um, I, I would feel confident that we can reach some agreements. Okay. Um, attendant harassment prevention task force investigated and brought enforcement actions, including criminal charges against property owners who harassed tenants by creating unsafe living conditions during construction. Did some of these property owners file false statements or misrepresent information on the construction permit? If so, what was the outcome? So we'd have to get back to you about the, the specific instances, but the, the broad answer is yes. Um, the enforcement actions in this case are, um, are brought by the Attorney General's office. Um, happy to, to get back to you on all the specifics there. Would this bill, if it was enforced before, helped with some of the enforcement? I'm sorry, would- If the bill was in effect, would it all have still been the AG's office or would you have been able to do any, some other things? So again, issues of um, questions of harassment are cases that are generally brought either by, they're either brought by the tenant as part of a, a tenant action against the landlord and it's the court that determines it, um, or in very severe cases, um, I suppose it could be the Attorney General's office. It's not, it's not HPD who okay. would be the ones to say that this helps. Thank you. How often did these owners fail to correct violations of the building maintenance code or the construction codes? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. How often did the owners fail to correct any violations that were found of the, of the building maintenance code or the construction code? How many times, like in a- What was the success rate, I guess, in getting them to correct what you found as violations? Okay, so uh, we have uh, extensive data related to violations written and corrected, I'd, I'd need to get back to you on, you know, I can, we, we can break that out by year. Okay. Um, on 1678, just wanted to, I think this is 1679. Yeah. Just on, uh, on the questions and the discussions of um, if one, if there's a possibility that one, bringing one case to one venue might prevent another venue. Uh, isn't one discrimination and one harassment, so wouldn't it actually be two different claims which would prevent that conflict? Sure, so um, harassment is actually not defined under the city human rights law. It's, a, it's really a product, like sexual harassment, it's really a product of case law. So what we look at is treating someone differently or less well because of their protected status. We've sort of used the term tenant harassment as a way to describe this type of behavior, which is you know, mistreating someone, uh, forcing them out, um, not, do, not providing repairs or, or other services because of their uh, particular vulnerability. So if the underlying facts are identical, we may be running into a situation where while it might be called something slightly different, um, we may not be able to have those cases in both venues. Um, so, but I think it's, we're, we're open to exploring it further again because I think the tenant harassment provisions talk about threats, um, whereas the city human rights law covers, I think, a, potentially a broader scope, a broader range of behavior. So again, I think we just need to sort of all go back and, and think about the implications. Thank you. Um, does HPD receive harassment complaints related to protected classes of individuals? Yeah, we, we would refer uh, those cases to our partner agencies. Do, um, do, you, do you know if you receive any in general? Or do um, I think it would not be, not, not in a formal way, it would be in, a, in an informal way that um, uh, either a, a council member's office brings it to us, you know, in, informs us that they think something is going on and we would refer them to the, to the proper agency or um, it but you don't be, keep track of any of those types? It, no. Okay. What's the referral procedures? Um, we would 
simply uh, give the contact information over to our colleagues at the uh, at the commission. All right. Well, going forward, it it, it seems based, I guess, on the purview of HPD, you don't have a particular formal procedure. It would be good if we just want to see if we can keep some better track. So, going forward, if HPD can just maybe keep a record of any of the harassment complaints or possible referrals that are being made, uh, that will be helpful as we're trying to track everything. Good. Yes? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll discuss it. I, I need to discuss it with staff about what the mechanisms of that are, but I think it's a, it's a okay. valuable point that you're making. Um, 12, for 1269, has the city looked into the possibility of using CLT as a preservation partner to rehabilitate distressed assets such as at-risk HDFCs, long-term AEP buildings, property in the third-party transfer program, and property in the tax lien sale? We have not looked at CLTs for quite the number of um, as a preservation tool for most of those programs you noted. One, the, the East Harlem El Barrio CLT, which is one of the winners of, um, of the grant funding, um, I can tell you that their proposal um, includes um, uh, the rehab of existing properties and, and converting them into a mutual housing model. So, so that I would say is a is a preservation of existing affordable housing. Would you look into? Abs using ab no, absolutely. I think that um, again, as I noted in my testimony, I think that um, th this is a, a relatively new concept for the agency. I think it has a lot of different applications, um, and the programs that you um, ticked off are um, would would all be. Um, would all be eligible and, and, and might might be good fits. Uh, I so think, yes, um, we would definitely look into it. Uh, please do. Um, uh, I will be housing chair, I know, until 31st. Don't know what's going to happen after that, but um, so I, I doubt I'll be able to have an additional hearing on CLTs by the 31st, but I think it's a very important um, issue. And I know HP has a lot of things that they always follow up on, but I think this is a key one. Whatever purview I am here in the council, I would love to really follow up on that and see how we can use CLTs for those particular um, programs that we have and other ones as we're trying to. Obviously, we can't build ourselves out of the problem, and so we really got to figure out how to preserve what we already have. And so I think it will be very interesting to take a really hard look at that. And my hope is that if it's not me, the next chair really follow up on this question. Uh, do you have additional questions? Uh, so I'll now set the clock for five minutes for uh, other colleagues to ask questions. We were joined by Councilmember Ulrich, and we have Councilmember Rodriguez for questions. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, thank you for your leadership in Councilmember Menchacas on those important issues, housing, also immigrants' rights. You know, the city has a great opportunity to be the real role model, especially at this moment where we attack Donald Trump for many things that he do at the national level, but the question is, are we doing things completely different? And I believe that this is something where I hope that we as a city, in many areas, in all areas that we say Donald Trump is wrong here, then we should be the difference of that one. I think that I'm proud of the work that we at the council have been doing, also working together with this administration, but what we have done is not enough. We have to do better. And I think that when we look at the numbers of many cases of harassment, my question is, one, how many of those harassment cases that we had, let's say, last year that ended with those building owners being resulted in being guilty? That's one of my questions that I have for both, for a report complaint related to immigrant status and for the second one about harassment. Um, so I, I don't have um, the resolution numbers with me here today, but we can certainly get those numbers to you. What I will say is that the the litigation, the investigation and litigation process. I, I'm sorry, oh, for sorry. the purpose of the time, yes. I was interested about the numbers, so if okay. you don't have it, I just hope that we can report the numbers here for both 
sector, one for immigrants that have been complaining that they've been harassed because of the immigrant status, and also for tenant harassment. I think the numbers, some number are there in your testimony, but I'm interested to know how many of those have been resulted or those building owners being guilty. Second thing is, we cannot, October 16, I hold a press conference in front of 78 Taylor Street in Washington Heights. A building with 50% empty. And the way of how that building was empty, because that landlord was harassing everyone, from people that they were undocumented to people that they were living for 25, 30 years. Great working relationship with Vito. I know that his heart is there. But there's something wrong inside HPD. That here we are a year after, that building owners, not only he make that building 50% empty, but he owe half a million dollars to the city. So when are we a year after? Cabrini Boulevard between 178 and 177, four building, half of them empty in Washington Heights. And again, as a result of harassment to both immigrants and tenants living there for 25, 30 years. So I think it is important to get numbers. You know, where are we? Not just about reporting, but about action. And also, what are we doing? I just bring highlighting those two because they are local level. But you know, the chairman of this committee, be being a leader pushing for, we need more from the city side to say, we have a plan to go after those landlords. And I just gave you those two information that already I gave you to HPD years ago, but I don't see any action in those buildings remaining being 50% empty in a community that we're working together for the rezoning process that we know that we need to preserve as much as affordable housing. So my question is, you know, if you have any information, I don't think they, you know, I don't expect they have those information for those two buildings, but if you can come back to us, letting us know what's happening in those buildings and what is happening in those thousands of buildings in the city of New York, that those building owners, they're keeping 50% or a large percent empty as a result all those harassment that we are discussing today. And with that, I would like to be add my name to the other bill that will expand the definition of harassment. Thank you. Um, that was the first time I heard. I'm sorry, can you comment it that you think back to me? I was just gonna say that was the first time that I heard of those buildings. It sounds really absurd. So I, if you do have some information, I'd love to know what, what's going on with them. Yeah, I wanna get back to you with full details on that building, which we'll do later, later um, this week. And Councilman Rodriguez, I'd love to, as the chair, write a letter with you, if that would be helpful, to uh, ask HPD what's going on with those buildings. That sounds really absurd. So, thank you. Um, thank you. All right, um, there are no other council members signed up for questions. I want to say thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, thank you for working with us on these bills. We look forward to uh, taking your suggestions and getting some bills uh, that work for everybody and hopefully passing these as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we're going to go into the public's testimony. Uh, we're going to have everyone uh, provide two minutes of testimony each. The first panel is... I believe it's Norley Navano. I apologize in advance. Bronx Legal Services, Emily Goldstein from NHD, Jenny Stevens Romero, Make the Road, Shishi Wang, Mobilization for Justice, Bianca McPherson, Community Development Project, uh, UJC, who are testifying on 1721 and 1678A, and we've been joined by Council Member Torres. Ms. Navano? How do you pronounce your first name? Nori. Nori, okay. Oh, I got it, okay. Uh, Emily Goldstein, let's see. Jenny Stevens Romaro. Shishi Wang. Bianca McPherson. Okay. 
You can sit there if you like. And if anyone else wants to testify, uh, please fill out a card with the Sergeant of Arms. We will be swearing in this panel. If you could, uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Okay, great, thank you. You each have uh, two minutes. You can begin in order of your preference. Can you um, press the button? Thanks. Oh, just kidding. Thanks. Okay. Legal Services, New York City, welcomes the opportunity to give testimony today before the New York City Committee of Housing and Buildings, as well as the New York City Committee on Immigration. Um, we congratulate the speaker and the city council for recognizing that landlord harassment of tenants on based on immigration status is an important problem requiring corrective legis legislation and we strongly we strongly urge the city council to pass intro number 167A-8. My name is Nori Lee Navarro. I'm a staff attorney in the housing unit at Legal Services New York City, specifically in the Bronx. New York, uh, legal Services New York City is one of the largest providers of legal services for low-income people in New York City. With five borough offices and numerous offices for outreach, Legal Service New York City's mission is to provide expert legal assistance that improves the lives and communities of low-income New Yorkers. Um, historically, our priority areas have included housing, government benefits, and family law, but we have since expanded into consumer issues, immigration, foreclosure, unemployment, language access, education, and bankruptcy. Our office regularly advocates on behalf of low-income tenants who would benefit from the protections afforded by Intro 167AA. The cases we handle on a daily basis illustrate how the amendment of harassment laws to include discrimination based on immigration status is critical to the preservation of affordable housing in New York City, particularly in today's political climate. One case that our office handled involved a family of immigrants, a U.S. citizen tenant of record and his two immigrant cousins as his roommates from the DR. They lived in a rent-stabilized apartment, three bedrooms. They were sued by their landlord in a holdover case. The two immigrant roommates, they had previously provided documentation to be approved as lawful roommates. Later in the housing court proceeding, the landlord claimed that the roommates did not provide the proper documentation and now were requiring specifically U.S. passports. Luckily, they retained legal services as counsel. Uh, the attorney on, on the case was able to convince the landlord that the documentation was sufficient. Another case involved a superintendent who specifically preyed on and terrorized various immigrant tenants in the building. Our staff attorneys represented a tenant who lived in a rent-stabilized building. It had a tenants association and a substantial number of Bengali tenants. Can I have to ask if you can give oh, sorry, uh, a closing sentence? Yeah. Oh, yes, that was really fast. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, we basically welcome this amendment of definition for harassment, specifically that there's a lot of harassment claims that immigrant tenants cannot pursue in the housing court. We think it's really important that we can expand on that definition and we would definitely use it as a counterclaim in many of our cases. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. And just to help us move through the panel quickly, um, is there anyone that's not in support of this of the of the bill 1678? Everyone's in support. Great. Um, we will have we have your written testimony, and so if you can focus on cases that are going to be helpful to understand the impact, or any ways that are going to be important for for us to understand the um, uh, the bill's impact on on service providers and communities on making sure that we get information out. Those are the kind of things we want to hear. Uh, and if you can use that time in the two minutes to do that, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Shishi Wong, and I'm a staff attorney in the Housing Project of Mobilization for Justice, formerly MFY Legal Services. We thank the Committee on Housing and Buildings for holding this hearing on intro 1721 in relation to amending the definition of tenant harassment. I'm just going to go through a few examples of our clients that face these issues that the bill would um, assist with. Um, 
we are currently representing a rent regulated tenants at 336 West 17th Street. Tenants in the building have not had cooking gas since April 2015. DOB and HPD promptly placed violations on the buildings. However, to this day, the gas remains off. Uh, and uh, um, this has been true for both the, the current owner and the former owner. Uh, specifically, the former owner promised to restore gas service to prospective tenants who then moved in in reliance on those promises. Um, and so, uh, and then this, this building also has uh, a family of three living on an annual income of $28,000 and a 90-year-old great-grandmother who has lived in her apartment for over 40 years. So I would say specifically Section A1 and B2 of Intro 1721 would define these acts and omissions as tenant harassment per se. Uh, in addition, the landlord, the same landlord of 336 West 17th Street falsely certified that the building was not rent regulated and had no tenants. Similarly, another building we are representing, 29 East 29th Street, also falsely stated in several DOB applications that the building has no rent regulated tenants, but by MFJ's estimation, there are approximately 50 rent stabilized tenants living in single room occupancy units. Again, subsection A2 of intro 1721 would characterize these false certifications as tenant harassment. Um, another example, uh, we are represent, we're bringing a group HP action on behalf of tenants of 192 and 194 First Avenue. Uh, since purchasing the building in 2016, the own, owner illegally removed the hallway stairs, completely removed the fire escape leading to the roof, and submitted false and misleading documentation related to gas line work in the hallways. If I can pause you there, um, we, we, we have those cases, but if there's any kind of cl closing statement, we'd like, we'd like to hear that. Just, um, I think that I would just say that it's necessary for Intro 1721 to be passed, especially as advocates in housing court, yeah. where Again, as you, as you saw in, in HPD's testimony, um, it's, it's up to the tenants to bring these kinds of harassment cases. Right, right. We agree. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thanks. I'm going to not read through my whole testimony. Uh, my name is Emily Goldstein. I'm the senior campaign organizer at ANHD, the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. I want to thank Chairman Williams and Chairman Menchaca and the other council members in attendance for the opportunity to testify this morning. Um, for the past several years, ANHD has coordinated the Coalition Against Tenant Harassment, which includes community organizations from around the city, and we've been particularly focused on trying to pass a certificate of no harassment, which we hopefully will happen later this year. <laughs> um, we think that the intros that are, are being heard today are important both to eventually making that law function well as well as to really supporting tenants making full use of some of the other good legislation that's passed in recent months through the council such as right to council and um, the STS package. So we're here to, I'm here to voice strong support for both intro 1721 and 1678A. Um, for 1721, Honestly, repeated violations are one of the most common signs of tenant harassment day to day if you ask organizers who work in buildings. Over the past eight to ten years, unfortunately, um, as organizing strategies and local laws and enforcement programs have done some good to respond to more egregious forms of tenant harassment, landlords have adapted. And a lot of what is now commonplace and a lot of what is now sort of on the ground what harassment looks like is difficult to bring a strong case on, expanding the definition and amending it to update and sort of include some of the behaviors that are in 1721 would go a long way. Uh, similarly, I'd like to state support for 1678A, specifically addressing discriminatory threats and requests for proof of citizenship status. Frankly, we all know that immigrant communities are under attack and more protections are needed. One of the ways that those attacks happen is, especially in New York City, is through um, housing harassment, right, and trying to make people feel unsafe in their homes and in their communities in a myriad of ways. We think the language in this bill would help to make sure that people are able to stay in their homes and stay in their communities and feel the sense of safety and security that they deserve. Thank you, and I apologize because I've been saying Goldstein for a very, very long time, and it's Goldstein. That's Thank okay. You for <laughs> My name is Jenny Stevens Romero from Make the Road New York. I'm a housing advocate and law graduate. Uh, thank you to the chairs for scheduling this hearing and allowing us to participate. 
uh, Make the Road is an organization that consists of more than 18,000 members, most of whom are immigrants and many of whom live in substandard housing. Our organizers and legal team work with a lot of tenants who face harassment from landlords who want to push them out of their apartments, renovate those apartments, and then charge two or three times the amount of rent. I just want to focus on a couple of cases that are ongoing that demonstrate some of the common facts that a lot of our clients face. Um, one is in Bushwick, where a landlord has failed to make basic repairs for more than two years. The tenants have lived with leaks, mold, broken windows, and stairs that literally feel like they'll collapse under your next step. Um, instead of properly repairing the conditions, the landlord makes superficial repairs, clears the HPD violations, and then they reappear a short time later. Um, they also have falsely certified that repairs have been done when actually the condition still exists. So we have an HP proceeding in Housing Corps right now. Intro um, 1721 would allow us to point to specific provisions of the law and make that a stronger case. Um, in terms of Intro 1678A, we're also working in another building where we've started a 7A proceeding. The tenants have faced repeated threats from their landlord to call the police or immigration because they are all immigrant uh, tenants. So passing 1678A would show that New York City stands behind these immigrants who live in fear and vulnerability, and landlords know that and take advantage of, of the fear that these immigrants live in. So thank you again. <clears throat> uh, good morning and thank you to Chairperson uh, Jumani Williams and the Committee on the Housing and Buildings for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Bianca McPherson and I am a housing paralegal at the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center, or shortly CDP. Uh, we support intro 1721 and intro 1678A. Uh, moving to intro 1721, the Stanford Tenant Safety Coalition was proud to work with the, city, uh, with the New York City Council to pass 12 bills that provided tools for tenants to fight back against construction as harassment. This bill would build uh, on the Stanford Tenant Safety Act by holding landlords accountable for more of their unjust actions. CDP has dealt with many landlords who deliberately withhold services, falsify documents to the Department of Buildings to obtain permits, and correct violations in haphazard manner. When caught, landlords get away too lightly for these actions. These bills would allow tenants and their advocates to pursue more legal remedies and also deter landlords from engaging in this conduct. The law would also more closely mirror what tenants and advocates consider to be harassment, such as landlords asking tenants to miss work to provide access dates without making meaningful repairs, or only providing adequate heat when an HPD violation is placed. Moving to intro 1678A, uh, landlords use complaints and threats to complain to law, to law enforcement against agencies to selectively antagonize tenants of color and immigrants. One landlord in Sunset Park posted notices in all of his buildings advising tenants to cooperate with ICE officers when they knocked on your door, quote unquote. A landlord in Morningside brought an eviction case uh, against an undocumented tenant using her immigration status as the basis for the case. Some landlords deliberately increase tensions between white tenants and tenants of color. These practices are unacceptable and passing intro 1678A will send a strong message to landlords that New York City will not tolerate discriminatory harassment. CDP is also working with the Coalition Against Tenant Harassment to pass, and I'm closing now, so thank you. CDP is also working with the Coalition Against Tenant Harassment to pass a citywide certificate of no harassment program that would create a strong dissent, uh, disin, disincentive to tenant harassment by preventing landlords with a history of harassment from getting permits to renovate their buildings from the New York City Department of Buildings. An expanded definition of harassment would help make the, uh, the citywide certificate of no harassment legislation a better tool to prevent displacement and to generate new affordable housing when harassment has occurred. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any council members sign up for questions. Uh, no? Okay, uh, so council member Chaka. Thank you. And thank you all for your testimony and the casework that, that you're doing every day. Uh, really to your last point about sending strong messages uh, you're seeing here that there's alignment, and that's great. This is a kumbaya, uh, good, positive, and productive conversation in this public hearing. But I think the crux of this is going to be how we, post change in the law, are going to get the information out. Does anyone have any ideas right now, and we want to continue this conversation, on how we make that message broad 
uh, and impactful in our communities. Uh, you are all doing casework right now, and you're, you're in, in multiple ways. You're, you're bringing the, those cases in and, and bringing them through the, the justice system. In, my, in our offices, in the district office, people come. We have relationships with people in our organizations. How do we get this message out after we pass this, this piece of legislation? What's the most effective way uh, to get it out into communities that are going to need to hear it? If anyone has any ideas, and, and if you don't right now, that's fine, but we want to continue this conversation. I mean, the, uh, I don't know how insightful this is, but um, I think the most effective way is working through the local community organizations that do building level work so that this gets integrated into regular tenant association meetings and building flyering, right, and that there's just sort of new information about how to make use of these tools and, and some of the other tools that have been passed recently. I know a lot of the community organizing groups and tenant organizing groups have been at least starting to think about how do we make sure that people understand how to really use right to counsel and the STS package and hopefully certificate of no harassment in their day-to-day -day organizing so that the message trickles out. Um, so Make the Road not only provides legal services, but we do a lot of um, organizing, especially around housing issues. So we do have weekly meetings in Brooklyn and Queens, and uh, we have organizers who do Know Your Rights trainings for our members and anyone who wants to come in. Yeah, and I would echo that. MFJ, we have um, a number of clinics all over Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx. I was just at a clinic, CB10 clinic last night. So before I do individual uh, intakes, we always do like a five to ten minute um, sort of general um, announcements and we could include, you know. And these are know your rights. Kind know of your focus, rights, so, yes. Yeah. I, uh, f with my capacity, um, we work a lot with the, com the CD CDP works a lot with community based organizations and uh, through group uh, tenant uh, association uh, um, um, organizing, we see that a lot of the tenants don't have capacity to go to court. So what they do is they go through DHCR to to express their 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 issues. And so maybe having this conversation with DHCR and expanding what the definition, what if this law this bill is, becomes law, you know, explaining to them like what these is laws. Is it DHCR? Are. Yes, DH, New York State Homes of Community Renewal. Yes. Sir, say that one more time. The yes, DHCR. I no, the, the whole, the whole. The New York State. Uh, it's, it's not HCR. So it's Division of Housing and Community Renewal. They yes. now call it HCR. Community. Yes, oh, they, they yeah. dropped it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to get that. Oh, yeah. Clarified. Thank you. So probably having conversations with with the state agency as well may also help in spreading this. I just wanted to also explain that our office, Legal Services New York City, has a tenants' rights coalition in every every borough, where we work with different community-based organizations and tenant associations and buildings that we feel are specifically being targeted for gentrification and harassment to do group harassment claims. And we also partner with different city council members in our different boroughs. So we also have clinics where we provide information and advice about any kind of new claims they could bring in housing court. Organizers are gonna are gonna get the word out. Thank you. Uh, I actually do have one question myself. Um, for the legal service provided, uh, for undocumented clients, what is the advice you give? Do you go to CCHR? Do you go to housing court? How do you usually walk them through the process? Um, in what context? If they come and have, let's say, a harassment complaint, how, how, what advice do you give them? How do you guide them through that? Um, I, cause I imagine there's also some fear of really going into the system officially. Um, I guess just speaking on in my own experience, um, I've represented undocumented clients, um, but it, it was there was it, there was no harassment issue. It was more to do with a specific legal case. I say that again. So I, we, I myself haven't had any instances where I've gotten reports of harassment. Um, okay. So, but we would definitely, if it was a harassment issue, we would definitely work with you know the Commission on Human Rights about that. But um, but then it depends on the context. So if, you know a NYCHA tenant in a mixed um, status family has questions about their immigration status. 
that depends on the NYCHA procedures, you know. Um, so it's really a case-by-case, -case, you know, basis. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. Oh, did someone else? You have something else to say? I'm sorry. Um, so make the road when we have uh, facts that involve threats against someone uh, because they're an immigrant. We do always raise them in housing court, at least, you know, factually state that it happened. Um, we also had a case recently where we worked with the Mayor's Office for Immigration Affairs and the Human Rights Commission, and we did um, successfully fight the case against the landlord and the tenant did when I don't know the facts of what they obtained, but um, that was helpful. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Just so sorry. <laughs> um, there was a case that I was a uh, part of where we did bring a harassment claim to the New York uh, State Supreme Court, I believe, and actually those charges were dismissed. So it's really difficult to, to bring these kinds of cases in court. Thanks again. And one more, okay. And if I could also just add that there is the New York, sorry, there is the um, Human Rights Commission where we can advocate for our, cl our immigrant clients in that capacity. But unfortunately, it's very common that if a tenant is being harassed based on immigration status, there's probably another ground that they're being harassed on as well. So we can advocate for them in housing court on that capacity, but that's why this bill being passed would be really important so we can incorporate that into their counterclaims. All right, anyone else? Okay. This time I think I got it. All right. Uh, thank you so much again for all the work you're doing. Um, we have another panel. Uh, it's Christy Peel here, CNYC. CNYCN, yes? Oh. Jenny Action. Jenny Action from Picture of the Homeless. Jose Rodriguez from Picture of the Homeless. Yanira Del Rio, New Economy Project. Yanira here. And Matthew Dunbar, Habitat for Humanity, NYC, all testifying on behalf of, uh, for intro 1269. We're gonna have one more panel after that. This is all the folks that we have scheduled to testify. John, after this panel will be John Napolitano, Napolitano, Community Solutions, Brownsville Partnership, Paul Epstein, Northern Manhattan Community Land Trust, Paula Siegel, Community Development Project, and UJC, Jennifer Levy, Legal Aid Society, and I believe A. Michael Johnson is what we have here. So those folks can uh, get ready to come up after this next hearing, after this next panel. Thank you all. We'll swear you in now. Uh, do you all affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You each have two minutes to provide the testimony. You can begin in the order of your preference. All right. Great. Uh, Good late morning. Um, thank you to uh, committee chairs Williams and Menchaca and other members of the committees uh, for the opportunity to testify today about intro 1269. My name is Deyanira Del Rio and I'm a board member of the New York City Community Land Initiative, or NICELY, which is an alliance of community, base building, affordable housing, and economic justice groups, as well as longstanding and emerging community land trusts across New York City. Our alliance advocates for CLTs, specifically in the context of supporting creation and preservation of deeply and permanently affordable community-controlled housing and other critical community needs. And several other members um, of our alliance who are actively engaged in CLT organizing will also be speaking today. Um, for more than five years, our coalition has been leading coalition and community organizing, education and outreach, research and policy advocacy around New York City to build a movement in support of CLTs. We're thrilled to see growing support for community land trusts in the City Council. Um, we want to thank and recognize Councilmember Richards for his leadership and support of CLTs. Um, in our testimony, uh, we want to outline brief t uh, changes to the bill that we believe are needed before it moves forward. I also just want to highlight in my testimony the growing landscape of CLTs around the city and some additional policy recommendations 
as well. So first of all, um, city, uh, CLTs are a flexible and progressive model for land and housing development. You'll hear more from others and it's outlined in our testimony. Um, I just wanna highlight that in addition to preserving uh, affordable housing and creating mechanisms for meaningful community engagement in land use and housing decisions, CLTs are an uh, excellent tool to preserve public subsidies and ultimately the housing, the affordable housing stock in New York City, which is so vital. Um, I'm looking at that clock, wow. Okay, so uh, as, as you heard, um, there were recently uh, investments made in New York City and we were thrilled to see that. Um, that HPD announced it was channeling 1.65 million to local CLTs. Uh, Nicely is, uh, was selected to lead the two-year learning exchange that you heard a little bit about. And through that, we'll be building capacity at nine community-based organizations that are organizing CLTs. I just wanna mention them. They're CAV, Organizing Asian Communities, Community Solutions in Brownsville, Faith in New York, working with Northern Manhattan is not for sale. In the Bronx, there's the Mary Mitchell Center, Mott Haven, Port Morris Community Land Stewards, we Stay Nos Quedamos, and the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, and finally in Staten Island, the Northfield LDC, working with a coalition as well. So I just wanna underscore there is a growing range of groups around New York City that are pursuing CLTs, um, not just for affordable housing, but also for commercial and community space, for green open space and many other purposes. And again, one of the benefits of the CLT model is that it's very flexible and can be used in different ways to meet the needs that are identified by community residents themselves and to achieve cross subsidies and more. Um, can I have to ask you? Okay. Um, so uh, the, just one last thing I wanna say is that the bill, we're excited about that being a, a first step and we understand it's, it's essentially a conversation starter. Um, but we just wanna encourage the city council in pursuing legislation to advance CLTs, to prioritize deep affordability, and also to make sure that CLTs really uh, maintain and are defined um, right. by their community control, which is just fundamental. So thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Jenny Action. I work at Picture the Homeless, and I'm testifying today in my capacity as the policy committee co-chair at Nicely. Um, first of all, thank you all so much uh, for having this hearing. This is a really great opportunity to talk about issues that are so, so important to so many communities around New York City. Um, so first things first, just wanted to testify a little bit about Intro 1269, um, echoing Day's comments. This is a really amazing starting point, and we are really excited to work with you on a whole range of policy initiatives uh, to support the growth of CLTs. We think this is a great first step. Um, with that in mind, we just had a couple of suggestions on how we could expand or improve uh, the, the basis established in 1269. Um, two of the major points that we wanted to introduce. The first is uh, we would really like to see the definition of CLT expanded to really reflect the unique stewardship that a CLT provides. Specifically, we'd like to see references made to the governance structure of CLTs and to the need for community control within that model. Um, there's great definitions. Uh, we submitted some um, as part of this testimony. There's also a federal definition that's worth a glance. Um, so we really recommend looking to those. Um, the second piece, um, we always would like to see these, um, these tools used to expand and deepen affordability in New York City. Um, right now, the bill defines qualifying households as uh, those earning up to 165% of the AMI. And while we understand why that's the case, um, we would like to see the regulatory agreements that come out of this legislation really tie benefits uh, to developers or to the projects to the benefits for New York City. Um, we think that the Article 11 HDSC tax exemption is a really great model focused on the viability of the project and, and basing the incentives on that viability. And so we would like to see that reflected in future reg agreements. Um, last thing, we have a, a list of 2017-2018 policy recommendations that our committee thinks are really important. We know the Progressive Caucus has made uh, CLTs one of its 18 progressive ideas for 2018. We have lots of progressive ideas that we would really like to share with you. Um, so thank you for this time, and we're really, really looking forward to that conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, just before you start, sir, I just want to make sure we recognize the Brooklyn Collaborative School that's upstairs looking at us. I understand that they are all future politicians. I myself, I'm an elected official, uh, but they are also seniors, so congratulations, welcome. I hope this is all you hoped and dreamed it would be. 
You can go ahead, sir. Good morning. My name is Jose Rodriguez. I'm a member of Picture the Homeless and a Ban Banana Kelly Residence Council member. I want to thank, first of all, Melissa Mark Viverito for supporting the East Harlem El Barrio Community Land Trust and the Bacre Progressive Caucus of the City Council for making this a uh, priority in 2018. I'm excited to see interest in Community Land, land Trust and HPD and the City Council. PTH has been working for many years promoting CLTs, understanding the potential for making <clears throat> a major shift in displacement and gentrification policies. <clears throat> the, the CLT um, model is one of many ways to utilize vacant properties to provide deeply affordable housing for homeless and those most at risk of becoming homeless. The Housing Not Warehousing Act is another way. By having a yearly count on vacant properties and recommendations attached for housing of all city, state, and federal properties. I had the opportunity to see firsthand how Cooper Square CLT is able to keep residents in low-income apartments and allow small, small businesses to thrive and compete with large franchises. CLTs ensure nonprofit community organizations and properly owned by the city can best serve long established community residents. Human beings should not be looked down upon because of their economic struggles. Everyone should be able to have basic needs like a roof over their head, food, and opportunity to pursue the things in life that make them happy. Every single property that is vacant or mismanaged, oh my, okay, well, I'll go to the acts. With respect to this bill, Picture the Homeless is asking language recommending that CLT and MHA's housing models get first priority disposition for city, state, and federal vacant and mismanaged properties. Language to the definition of CLT that clarifies those CLTs should be strictly nonprofit entities with missions to keep housing out of the speculative market for life. This bill is an important first step, and we have a lot more work to do. Picture the Homeless is looking forward to continuing the work with you on CLT and other solutions to the homeless crisis. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Leo Goldberg. I'm a senior policy associate at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. The Center promotes and protects- I'm sorry, what's your name? Leo Goldberg. You're standing for Christy Peel. That's right. All right, can we get him to fill out a card, please? All right, thank you. The Center promotes and protects affordable home ownership in New York and meets the diverse need of homeowners throughout New York State by offering free, high-quality housing services. Since our founding in 2008, our network has assisted over 40,000 homeowners. CLTs are great vehicles for expanding affordable homeownership in addition to their use on rental housing and public space, community gardens, etc. Unlike traditional subsidized homeownership programs, public investments in CLT homes are recycled from one homeowner to the next. They are not lost when the homeowner sells, perhaps at a windfall profit. CLTs also act as stewards not only of land and property, but also of homeowners and communities' well-being. In addition to pre-purchase education, CLTs can provide homeowners with financial literacy training, assistance with repairs, and financial oversight and support to prevent foreclosures. In this way, CLTs help prevent families from getting in over their heads and safeguard against predatory lending, scams, and foreclosure. In light of the severe challenges posed by our housing market, the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, Habitat for Humanity, NYC, who you'll hear from in a second, uh, Manny and UHAB are partnering to create the Interborough Community Land Trust, New York City's first citywide community land trust, with a primary focus on creating permanently affordable homeownership opportunities for low-income families. Interborough CLT will work closely with HPD and New York State Homes and Community Renewal to identify finance and steward properties and to ensure the homes developed on the CLT remain affordable for future generations of New Yorkers. 
This bill is an important first step in identifying CLTs as an uh, entity that the city can do business with, and we look forward to working with the committee on strengthening the bill, strengthening its definition of what a CLT is, and making sure that the types of regulatory agreements that result from it are useful to CLTs and allow for their growth and expansion. We think that particularly for home ownership, the bill is important because not all home ownership projects will be eligible for an Article 11 tax exemption, and there will have to be new kinds of regulatory agreements with single family homes on community land trusts, which we identify as a, a viable type of housing on community land trusts, especially in low rise neighborhoods in Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and elsewhere. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, my name is Matt Dunbar. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations and Advocacy with Habitat for Humanity New York City. Um, I wanna thank the chairs and Councilman Richards for, for introducing the bill, as well as for HPD for all the work that they've done so far on community land trusts. And we really appreciate and, can, and look forward to continuing partnering and developing the model and its success in New York City. Um, we, we are, as Leo mentioned, are, are members uh, of the Interborough Community Land Trust, and I just wanted to highlight a very real uh, way in which this, this bill, uh, which we support uh, we, and have suggested changes within our written testimony um, to make it stronger. Um, but I wanted to highlight one of the purposes of this bill, uh, which of course, as Leo mentioned and everybody here mentioned, is the first step in getting community land trusts mentioned in the administrative code um, because community land trusts are not mentioned on the state or local level. So this is that first step, which is great. Um, but what it also accomplishes is by uh, entering into a regulatory agreement with a community land trust on the land uh, that has all of the housing on it, it provides a stronger level of uh, restriction for the homes, but it also will provide an opportunity for tax uh, relief for homeowners, uh, in which case their, uh, their tax uh, exemptions or abatements may run out. And uh, the reason why I bring this up is because uh, Habitat for Humanity New York City has uh, built, rehabbed, and repaired over 650 homes in New York City. But many of those um, are, are vulnerable to being lost uh, to the open market as they have been built with evaporating uh, mortgage restrictions uh, and have limited uh, tax relief built in uh, many of which are within 20 years. Uh, so once those homes are sold, um, those are, are lost uh, to affordability. But by partnering with a land trust, it strengthens and extends the affordability for 99 years and is renewable. Uh, but uh, in those circumstances, when the tax abatements run out, uh, they may be vulnerable to be taxed at market rate. And the city's ability to uh, provide uh, real fair assessment so that the tax assessments for a homeowner would actually reflect what they can be sold for uh, is a regulatory agreement. So by having that CLT underneath, say, a single family home, when their tax abatement runs out, even though they're restricted to sell it at a, at a low income price, um, they will receive benefits rather than seeing their, their houses being taxed at market rate. So again, we support the bill. We have provided some, some changes, some that reflect uh, what has been mentioned here and, and others. So we encourage uh, the, the council to review. Uh, and so thank you so much for, your uh, for the time and opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony and all the work that you're doing. Please continue as we continue the fight. Thank you so much. And our last panel, unless others have signed up, John Napolitano, Paul Epstein, Paula Siegel, Jennifer Levy, and A. Michael Johnson. Collaborative. Do you want to get that? No, I want to sit next to Michael. <laughs> no, this hand. You want to go first? We have uh, John Napolitano, Paul Epstein, and Paula Siegel, Jennifer Levy, and A. Michael Johnson. So let's, uh, uh, we are going to swear you all in. Okay, uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony uh, before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions today? Absolutely. Yes, wonderful, thank you. You least have two minutes to provide your testimony. You can begin the order of your preference. 
Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Afternoon. <laughs> My name is John Napolitano, and I offer this written testimony in support of Community Solutions and the, our local initiative, the Brownsville Partnership, on the intent behind council, City Council Bill, Intro Bill 1269. All power comes from the land, while all absolute power comes from God. These prophetic words spoken by Charles Sherrod in the movie Ark of Justice serves as the spark of the Community Land Trust movement that began nearly 50 years ago. For those unfamiliar with the movie, it is a documentary that speaks about the courageous work of a farm collective of approximately 5,000 acres in Lee County, Georgia, that advocated for the long-term protection of this land to serve as a safe haven for black farmers who inherited it from their slave ancestors. At the heart of this inspiring story speaks about one community's perseverance to protect one of its most important assets, its land. In Brownsville, Brooklyn, where my organization is based, we are venturing to establish a community land trust with the support of Enterprise Community Partners, the New Economy Project, and HPD whose vision builds upon the goals and strategies of the new Brownsville plan. Within its 1.2 square mile radius exists 91 vacant lots where approximately 150,000 unbuilt square feet can produce 1,000 dwelling units according to HPD. If combined with the new commute facility uses to support important service delivery around health, education, workforce development, these sites can render even more square footage. Despite the ultimate aim of repurposing this land as housing whose affordability is perpetually protected, our broader goal is to develop the capacity of community-based organizations that wish to remain in Brownsville for generations and invest in the people that make it a special place to so many. This was the vision of our founder, former New York Gregory Jackson, which centered on community mobilization to build local infrastructure and support collective problem solving in Brownsville. We applaud the City Council on their focus for this bill and support the future work of community land trusts in Brownsville and across the city. The model would help communities reclaim their most valuable outland assets while providing much needed stewardship and oversight. The success of this model depends on flexibility, Can responsiveness, to, last sentence, okay. responsibility and innovation to lessen the financial burden of government while permitting C CLTs to serve as their fiduciary agents of the communities that they are meant to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Paul Epstein from the Northern Manhattan Community Land Trust Working Group. We're a CLT in formation, chosen to participate in Nicely CLT Learning Exchange by HPD. And I thank Chair Williams and the committee for the opportunity to testify. I'm pleased that the council wants to give CLTs recognition in the city's code. I have seven recommendations to improve intro 1269. My written testimony provides more context and justification. I'll be very brief now. Other than Cooper Square, there's no significant CLT experience in our city, so now we need a learning and experimentation environment, not a rules-based environment. So my first three recommendations are add a statement of purpose that says it's the intention of this act to enable and encourage broad experimentation with wide variety of CLT practices for affordable housing and other uses across the city. On the last line of the bill, I would strike the words, including the promulgation of rules so you don't encourage rulemaking by HPD at this time. Number three, specify in the bill that HPD work with CLTs on, with, on regulatory agreements that vary case by case for specific projects, and the agency and CLTs evaluate how different agreements work over time to improve future agreements. Next, housing is not the only way CLTs can contribute to neighborhood improvement. Uh, there are a lot of other ways, and in Northern Manhattan, we would probably want to also help small businesses, performing arts organizations, and, keep, and, and other ways. So recommendations four and five do not lim limit CLTs to housing, add to the end of the definition, and for other community benefits. Recommendation five acknowledged in the bill that CLTs may sometimes allow projects that involve higher user costs be beyond affordability to cross-subsidize affordable housing for financial s stability. Also, CLTs are not just any nonprofits with land. So my sixth recommendation is revise the definition of a CLT to say that it is community controlled with a, with a key purpose to provide stewardship of land for the benefit of the community. Uh, I would not recommend making the CLT definition any more specific than that, except perhaps to specify 
that a majority of the CLT's board should live or work in the CLT's community. Finally, intro 1269 provides no funding which CLTs, especially new ones, will need. So the council should establish a fund to support CLTs for purposes I describe in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony. I want to thank Chairperson Jamani Williams for his leadership on legislation that fosters the creation and preservation of affordable housing and protects low-income tenants. I also want to thank the entire City Council for its visionary approach to meeting the needs of New Yorkers facing the devastating impact of the city's affordability crisis. My name is Jennifer Levy. I'm the supervising attorney for the Civil Law Reform Unit at the Legal Aid Society. And we're here to present testimony in support of Intro 1269. But for the record, we also support the other two introductions that you heard testimony on today. Um, as we, uh, we all know in this room, New York City is in the midst of a crisis. That crisis, precipitated by a lack of truly affordable housing, has resulted in a in record-breaking number of homeless families. While the current administration is striving towards the laudable goal of creating or preserving 200,000 units of affordable housing, those units, if they follow the affordable housing models that precede them, will not be permanently affordable and will not solve the city's housing or homelessness crisis. This is for two reasons. First, the patchwork of subsidy programs that make up the city's affordable housing landscape do not ensure permanent affordability. And second, the housing that is being created does not satisfy the demands of those in the lowest income tiers. Intro 1269 is a first step towards creating a model that would ensure permanent affordability. For that reason, we urge its adoption. However, with a definition of affordability that permits occupancy by households earning up to 165% of area median income, it does not go far enough in mandating the creation of truly affordable housing. Rent stabilization accounts for the main stock of affordable rental housing in the city, but the city has lost 150,000 rent stabilized housing units over the past 20 years. We have lost about 450,000 Mitchell Lama units since 1985. Units made affordable as a result of participation in LIHTC, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, are leading out of the city at a rate of 11,000 units a year. We need permanent affordable housing, and that's why we support the introduction of 1269. And we need housing that meets the needs of, of the lowest income tiers in the city. So we need to define affordability at a lower rate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right before you start, sorry, um, Valerio Arcelli. Can you just join them, please? I know you just signed up to testify. So we'll just have you up there. You can just join and you'll testify then. You can continue. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Williams and the committee. I'm speaking today as an attorney in the Equitable Neighborhoods Practice of the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center. You heard from my colleague, Bianca, earlier today, who works in our housing unit. CDP works with grassroots groups, neighborhood organizations, and community coalitions to help make sure that people of color, immigrants, and other low-income residents who've built our city are not pushed out in the name of progress. We work together with our partners and clients to ensure that residents in historically under-resourced areas have stable housing they can afford, places where they can connect and organize, jobs to make a good living, and other opportunities that allow people to thrive. Our clients overwhelmingly recognize community land trusts as a property stabilization tool that is key to keeping their communities whole and in the places that they've made valuable for decades, uh, with decades of labor. When HPD uh, opened up the opportunity that you heard about earlier to respond to their request for expressions of interest, uh, five of our client organizations applied and were selected for participation in the learning network. So that's CAV, the Mary Mitchell Center, Nos Quedamos, uh, Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition, and we helped uh, Faith in New York and the Inwood CLT uh, put together their proposal as well. Um, we want to thank the committee and Council Member Richards for their leadership in putting CLTs on, on the city agency's agendas and for paving the route to collaboration. You heard a little bit from my colleague uh, Jennifer Levy about the bleeding of affordable housing in New York City. Uh, CLTs, on the other hand, allow community members and city agencies to explicitly contract for stewardship and to plan for what happens when regulatory agreements expire, for when rent laws are changed, or for even when the CLT itself is no longer operating. 
Those are all terms that can be carefully drafted and included in ground leases that can also include reverter provisions that direct what will happen to properties on the CLT if the CLT itself is no longer able to steward and allow us to decide at the outset to protect properties from the open market for perpetuity, for the duration. The bill before you is great, but it doesn't go far enough to build a solid foundation. My written testimony makes recommendations for changing existing programs in small ways to, that will really make a big difference, specifically altering how HPD issues its request for proposals and request for qualifications, expanding the purview of the bill to include agencies beyond housing preservation and development, and directing HPD to open the third party transfer program to CLTs and to prioritize development teams that include a CLT in that program. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Johnson, and I, I thank you for the opportunity to testify in front of this council and this chair. And uh, as a member of the board of directors for our South Bronx based land, community land trust, the Mount Haven Port Morris Community Land Stewards, and a board member of the New York City Community Land Initiative, I'm here to testify in support of Intro 1269 to extend its scope and to, for it to be to ask for its scope to be extended to be more comprehensive and particularly in line with suggestions put forth by Nicely's testimony that you heard earlier. My community in the South Bronx and Mott Haven, Port Morris, is diverse and vibrant and struggling to overcome decades of environmental injustice, economic neglect that, is, that has caused the high, high rates of asthma and diabetes and obesity in the country. Our community is currently ranked as the worst New York City community in which to raise children based on indicators such as health, education, and economic security. Our community is now also fortifying itself against the loss of culture in the face of hypergentrification, where more than two dozen new development, luxury developments uh, are, are either near completion or have building permits that are being placed in a community with, in which 38% of its residents and 49% of its children live in poverty. It is for these reasons we formed a community land trust about two and a half years ago as a natural opposing force to unchecked real estate speculation and a vital tool in which to create true community engagement and empowerment and stewardship of local resources. We, look, we have looked at this opportunity um, and this to create a CLT as the natural opposing force to this real estate speculation that's hitting our community. That's the only thing that we can see that can help make sure that publicly owned spaces and places can be owned and, and stewarded by the community in perpetuity. Again, thank you for the opportunity to give my testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Is it Aureli? How do you pronounce your name? Uh, good afternoon and thank you. Oh, I'm you. sorry, one second. Uh, oh. I just want one, did I pronounce your name correctly, Aureli? I'm sorry. What's the proper Oh, Valerio Orselli. Orselli, Valerio Orselli. Can you please raise your right hand? Oh, sure. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Uh, you have two minutes to give your testimony, and you can begin. Thank you. Okay. Again, thank you very much, and good afternoon, Committee Chair Williams and members of the committee for holding this hearing, allowing the public to, tes to testify about Intro 1269 amending a portion of the New York City Administrative Code. As noted, my name is Valerio Orselli, and I am the Project Director of the Cooper Square Community Land Trust, CSCLT. I am also a founding member of Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association and Cooper Square Community Land Trust. Cooper Square CLT is the owner of the land underneath 21 formerly city-owned multiple dwelling buildings that make up the Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association a nonprofit scattered site housing cooperative in Manhattan's Lower East Side. We are a party to a 40 years Article 11 regulatory agreement between the New York City Housing Preservation Development and Cooper Square MHA. We have also executed a 99 year lease, a ground lease between the COT and Cooper Square MHA. We're also members of and fully support the position of the New York City Community Land Initiative regarding the proposed legislation with the additions. By bringing some 21 buildings into a single cooperative structure, the Cooper Square MHA can share income 
both commercial and residential, amongst all its buildings. It can purchase fuel and supplies, insurance and services at a discounted price. It is also able to charge an economic rent sufficient to cover all the expenses, plus set aside some additional income to fund a common reserve fund. When time comes, for example, to replace a building boiler, the funds to cover the cost come not from an individual building with 15 tenants, but from all 21 buildings in a cooperative. This creates an economy of scale that helps to ensure the long-term affordability of the housing. Unfortunately, the economy of scale is not sufficient to ensure permanent affordability. Much depends on the integrity of the governing body of a rental project or a cooperative. Such governing bodies have often failed to fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities, water and sewer taxes are not paid, capital improvements are not carried out, and maintenance fees are not raised on an annual basis to cover building expenses. Apartments are sold or rented out under the table for market value. The affordable housing is no longer affordable. That is where the, the community land trust comes in as an Mr. important- Mr. Oswelli, I'm gonna have to ask you to give a closing statement, please. Okay, that's where the CLT comes in. By owning the land underneath the building, the CLT has enforcement powers uh, to monitor compliance with the regulatory agreement and also having representation on the, on the MHA board, on any cooperative board. It can enforce the requirements of both the regulatory agreement and the ground lease, which can and is stricter than the regulatory agreement. For that reason, we support the legislation and we support additional legislation to provide uh, tax benefits of CLT and to, uh, a little rushed, um, and preferential options for city-owned property to be conveyed to the CLT. Thank you very much uh, for all your testimony. Just one quick question, I think for uh, you, Mr. Orselli, and for Mr. Epstein in particular, uh, both reference Cooper, Cooper Square CLT. Um, I forgot who it was, someone, I think it was you, Mr. Epstein, that mentioned funding that was needed. How much are needed to, for upstarts of CLTs? What's the, what's uh, the? I, I, I did not try to figure a specific amount. Obviously, um, to actually provide funding to buy land, to buy private land, it's not already public yeah. land that can be given at, at a, uh, at a uh, you know, for nothing, or for, for a dollar or something, that and may so be, the, that may be so beyond clear. what council could do. But I, just so, um, I just want to clarify. I, I assume the, f the so there's two kinds of funding. So were you referring to capital funds for actually for the land, or were you talking about funds for the nonprofit to do the other things that are needed to get the COT up and running? Well, primarily the latter, but I would say both. The capital funds may not have to be 100% to buy the land, but it might be starter capital that can enable a CLT more easily to get loans or grants by having that starter capital. So smaller amounts of starter capital, not necessarily to buy the land, but to get loans and be able to leverage that for loans and grants. And then other funding for operating costs for doing all kinds of things that's needed in the community to support the CLT's activities. Thank you. Uh, to supplement that, if you're going to build any kind of affordable housing in Manhattan or any gentrified neighborhood, the cost of the land purchase uh, will be prohibitive in the open market. It has to be for little or no amount of funding. The capital uh, money should be used mostly for renovation or new construction. Um, that's the basic for it. The, to the extent that we had to borrow money, say, to renovate the housing, that translates into less affordable housing. The more you borrow, the more the housing is going to cost. The less you borrow, or if you don't borrow, like in our project, it was done with federal and city capital budget funds, we're able to charge rents that are nominal, like a one bedroom rents about 375 or $400 a month, and we're mostly self-sufficient. Um, even so, with those very low rents, about 10% of our people need Section 8 to afford them. So that's why we had uh, structured the rents in such a way that even if we lose the Section 8 or the subsidy, it will still remain affordable to families at 50% of AMI. That's not low enough, but that's what we're able to accomplish. 
Sure. Can I just add a little bit? So you start, you asked specifically about startup CLTs. Um, the startup CLTs are emerging from organizing groups that are doing the base building work and are doing the work to set up the governance and to align community goals so that the permanent affordability that Val just described can be supported and encouraged in a neighborhood. And those are the startup, startup funds that groups really need. The groups in the learning network are not seeing any of the money that came from the Attorney General settlement through Enterprise to HPD. HPD is using that money to fund the folks who are running the network, which is great, and using that money to fund some of the capital needs of the three CLTs they talked about earlier, which is great. But the organizers that are doing the heroic work of preserving neighborhoods also need startup funding to fund that work, and that isn't funded at all. It would be great if the council would. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for your testimony and the work that you're doing. You're all doing amazing stuff. I do have to give a, a personal privilege to shout out Jennifer Levy, uh, only because for many, many days, many years ago when I was a community organizer and housing director, I harassed her on a daily basis <laughs> to try to figure out how I can help the tenants that I was trying to assist. So. I thought you were going to ask me about how I dealt with harassment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but we did but thank together. you very much. And... <laughs> Because of you, we actually successfully we did. Uh, made sure we, well, I think it was the first case to successfully try and make sure that tenants had the right to organize um, for better conditions. So that was a, a landmark case. That's so. right. We did that. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your, for you. your work. And want to make sure that we put in the record uh, RSA and Rebney's testimony, opposition of intro 721, 1721, and ABO testimony on the record as well. Thank you, everyone, for this hearing and to the Sergeant of Arms for keeping order. With that, this hearing is now adjourned.